We're going to continue today in our study that Jesus is our living hope. And we're going to study in 1 Peter. We're picking up in chapter 1 where it says, Jesus is our living hope when pressured to conform. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I was a kid when I was a kid. The poor kids today are pressured everywhere, aren't they? All these external pressures, and then, I don't know, you've had your head buried in the sand, if you haven't seen in in the news, how in the schools they're trying to teach the kids that they get to choose their gender. That's just a pressure they don't need. There, There is so much pressure in our world that I didn't grow up with. Boy, when I was a kid, we went out and played on the street until the street light went on, And that was the signal to every kid I knew you had to go home. Today, you can't let your child out because you don't know what evil pressures out there are going to go after your child. Wow. There's all sorts of pressures in the world, and uh, the world wants you to conform to it. Now, I have up here a jello mold. How many know what that is? Just raise your hand. Okay. All right. You know what gelatin is, you get the mold, you whip up the gelatin, and you pour it in there, and and then what you do is you allow it to set, and and once it's set, you take the mold off, and it is exactly what that mold shape was. Now, you can put all kinds, and this one, I think, actually has one of those little things you put on the top, and you put a little extra emblem in it, and that kind of thing, but uh, you know how that works. The world has its mold, too. Why do you think they want to get the kids when they're young? If they can influence a child's mind when they're young, then they'll have them for life. That's the thinking that's going on. Satan is no dummy. He wants us to conform to the world. You see, there's three enemies to every believer in Christ. There's the world the whole world system that is against us, and we as Christians go counterculture to that. And then there's the flesh, my flesh. It craves evil things. Did you ever notice that? Did you ever notice when there's a newborn baby that that baby, you don't have to tell that, you don't have to teach that, that baby to say, mine. You have to teach the baby to say, share. <laughs> Why? We are born as part of Adam's race with a sinful disposition and we are attracted to what is wrong. So I have the world as a mold. I have my flesh that craves that world. And then there's Satan who knows exactly which one of my buttons to push. Do you know what I'm talking about? Now, I'm not tempted by coffee. Now, I make it here every Sunday morning. If you drink it, I made it but I didn't taste it. I don't like coffee. But I am tempted by a nice ice-cold diet cola. You see, we're not all tempted by the same thing. So Satan realizes what your button is that you're attracted to in the things in the world. And so he wants us to be poured into that mold where you are most tempted and, and you conform to that and he wants you to conform to the world so that you turn out being his product. Not a godly product, an ungodly product. Not one that belongs to Jesus, but one that's following just the opposite path that leads to death. The Apostle Paul writes this in Romans chapter 12. After 11 chapters of really deep theology, if you want to read deep theology in the New Testament, you go to the book of Romans chapters 1 through 11, and at chapter 12, verse 1, he says, therefore. Anytime you see a therefore, you've got to stop and see what it's there for. <laughs> He's saying that everything that's following this is because of what I said before. He says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know what that means? That means, Lord, here, I'm bringing my body. I'm going to die for you. Because that's what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice is life is taken away. And so I'm saying, Lord, take my life. 
You see, somebody, people think that being a Christian is easy stuff. No, it's not. Getting saved is really easy. I just accept Jesus as my Savior, but then living as a Christian is very tough. I have to put myself to death. I, I, I offer my body a living sacrifice. Notice the word there, holy, because I'm going to come back to that. It's holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Oh, listen to me. If you want to worship God today, you give him your body. And say, Lord, I'm going to live for you. Now, here's where I've been coming to. I'm, this is all preface to what I want to say. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't find yourself in the jello mold of the world. Don't conform. Conform. You take on the shape of the world. You shouldn't look like, smell like, act like, taste like, be like the world at all. We should stand out as being different. Some would call us weird. Some would call us strange. They call us a lot of things. The New Testament says we're aliens. Now, I don't think it means little green monsters, you know, with the big eyes. But it's talking about we're strangers and sojourners. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, this is taking me where I want to go. Everything starts with your mind, what you think, what you think. Be transformed. <clears throat> Transformation is what takes place when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and then comes out a butterfly. And what he's saying is, listen, if you rework what you think, it will change who you are, it will renew you, and you will be able to test, approve what God's will is. You want to know what God's will is? Then you better start being transformed by the renewing of your mind, thinking God's thoughts after him, because then you'll know his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed. Don't conform to this world. How are you transformed? You've got to prepare your mind. Those of you who are taking notes, the bulletin for fill in the blank is prepare your mind. Prepare your mind. Peter picks up at verse 13 of chapter 1 after <clears throat> last week's about, hey, when you're tested, he says here, now prepare your mind for action. Prepare your mind. I don't know if he had this verse in mind from Proverbs 23, 7, but I think it fits. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You see, in the Semitic concept, you didn't think just with your head, you think with your heart. <laughs> you, you did your thinking, was, this is your deep, inmost thinking. He says, deep down in your heart, what you think is what you are. You become what you meditate on. Therefore, prepare your mind for action, to do something. And here it is, be self-controlled. Be self-controlled. I wish I had a dial on the side of my head. <laughs> that I could just twist that dial and it would change my mind, like changing the station on your TV clicker. <laughs> and I could think good things when those bad things pop in. And sometimes you have to do that. As a child, I was having a nightmare. It's because my brother convinced me to watch a Frankenstein movie with him when I was a little too young. And I had this, I had this nightmare, and I, I did this in my head. I said, Dennis, all you got to do is change the channel. And I turned it in my brain, in my head. I convinced myself I was going to watch something happier in my dreams. It worked. Because the Bible says be self-controlled. He's not asking us to do anything we can't do. I can change what I think about. I don't have to think on evil things. I don't have to, let, I don't have to think on that temptation. I can resist. I can change the channel. He says, and set your hope fully on grace to be given you when Jesus Christ reveals. This is about God's grace. Now, the word grace means a gift. Think about what God has given you. You know what he gave me? 
Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. He gave me the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment I got saved, I was saved by grace. That happened a long time ago. Every day when I trust in the Lord, I am experiencing the grace of God every day. This passage says, hey, set your hope fully on the grace that is in the future. There is a future grace. God who gave you the gift of salvation right now will give you a way out of every trial, tribulation, and difficulty as we saw last week. That same God is going to deliver you one day when you are glorified from the very presence of sin. He says, fix your mind on God's grace. All that God has for you. Second thing, after you prepare your mind, you get your mind ready. Obey the Lord. He says, as obedient children, do not conform. There's our conformity. Just don't let the world put you into his mold. Don't conform, he says, to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. He said, listen, you used to have evil desires. You used to want to live like the world. But now that you're a Christian, he says, you've got to stop, get self-control, and you can't conform to what you used to do. But what you used to do made you feel so good. But now when you do it, you don't feel good. Soon as you've done it, guilt sets in that I've been disobedient to the Lord and you feel worse afterward than you did before. And I, but here's what I want to tell you. There's this thing called the synaptic lag. Your synapse, you see. You go to the doctor and cross your leg and he gives you a whack on your knee, right? And the hope is that the signal is passed on from one nerve to the next through your synapse and goes all the way up to your brain and your brain says, oh, you just got whacked. And it sends that message all the way back that says, kick. <laughs> There's a lag. You watch when it happens. It takes just a fraction of a second, but that's the electric neurons going up and down. I'm going to tell you, when you do what is right, it doesn't always feel good at the moment. Because there is a spiritual synaptic lag that says, oh, I'm going to feel good later because I did what was right. You know why? Because when you cave into that evil desire, you feel guilty. But if you just do what is right and you fight off that evil desire, once you've gotten past it, all of a sudden you feel really good because you were victorious. See how that works? As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Ephesians puts it this way, all of us who lived among, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. That's before we became Christians. Once we become Christians, that all changes. That word but, I don't know if I marked that or not. No, I didn't. That big word, but, up there, because every time you see that, you know that it negates everything that went before it. <laughs> He's saying, all those evil desires and things you had, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, mercy means not giving, up, giving us what we deserve. Oh, God is rich in not giving me what I deserve for all that lifestyle I had. He made us alive. He infused life within us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions and sin. You see, the wages of sin was death. I was spiritually dead. And so he infused life within me, and he says this. I love this expression. It's by grace you have been saved. It was a gift that God saved you, and he's still working on you. He's still working on you. How do I know that? Titus says this. For the grace of God that brings salvation. Oh, that's what Jesus did. He brought us salvation. Has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Wow. I can obey because the grace of God is there for me to obey. I just have to avail myself to his grace, and I just have to do what he wants me to do. And later the good feelings will kick in because I have done what is right, and it just works that way. Prepare your mind, obey the Lord. And the third thing he says, 
<clears throat> when you're pressured to conform to the world and, and, and the old lifestyle you used to live and you want to just break free from all of that, he says, but just as he who called you, God who called you is holy. God is holy. Some theologians claim that this is the number one foremost attribute of God. He is holy. Everything else that he is is second to this. I'm not sure about that. I'm not that great of a theologian. But I do know holiness means to set apart and to dedicate. Set apart and dedicate. So God is set apart from all that is contrary to all his perfections. God is set apart from sin. He cannot sin. God is dedicated to all his perfections, all that he does. He is perfectly holy. That's what it means. God is holy. He so says, just as, as, as he who called you is holy, so he says, be holy in all you do, for it is written in Leviticus 11.44, be holy because I am holy. Be set apart, be different, because I am set apart, and I am different. Just about anything can be set apart. Anything. I had a bucket of bolts set apart in my garage. Now, to anybody who would come clean my, my garage, they would be the first to go. They were old, they were rusty, and it was like just junk, just junk. But I had deliberately set them apart because those bolts were very valuable to me, but to no one else. You see, I had taken those bolts out of my 1926 Chevy. <laughs> they were the fender bolts. In fact, that's what the bucket said, fender bolts because I took the car apart, right down to the frame. I loaded it on a trailer, I took it to this place, and I had a guy sandblast the whole frame. And then I, I took it back to the, to the house, and, and my brother and I, uh, he, he painted it. I, I have to say he did it, cause, but I was there, but he painted it. Uh, he was a body repairman, and he painted that frame with, with a primer. Well, we filled in the rust spots uh, where they made craters, and, and he did, I should say he did, and uh, then he put the final coat on it, and there I had the frame. The engine was sitting in a cradle that I'd made, and, and it was just the frame. The bolts were still in that bucket. It wasn't time for the bolt yet, okay? And so then, piece by piece, it started going back together. We put the body on, and my dad had, because all the wood, it had a wood substructure to it, and all the wood had rotted away. And my dad was a pattern maker in the automobile car industry. And he made all the wood for it. The steering wheel was a tilt-away steering wheel. Can you believe that? 1926. It was a wooden spokes, four spokes. On the, it had a rim around it. It was a metal, but it had a wooden rim around it. My dad made a new, new one. It looked just like the original. It had a little clip on it. You squeeze it, and you could lift the steering wheel out of the side. The thing that Chevy had over the Model T Ford was you could get in on the driver's side. A Model T Ford, you had to get in on the passenger side because the steering wheel is in the way of the door. Isn't that amazing? Those bolts didn't mean a thing to anyone else. But they were special and set aside for a purpose. You see, that's what holiness is about. God says we're to be holy, set apart from everyone else on planet earth as special for the purpose he has for us. Well, I worked on that car for a long time and I have to tell the story. It has to be complete. I got it halfway done. And then I started on my doctor's degree. <laughs> and it sat. And it sat. As I went to school, instead of went into the garage, I went into the books. And I, it sat and it sat. Finally, uh, my wife says, if it sits one more year in the garage, it's got to go. If you don't do something on it for another year, it's got to go. And a year went by and she said, your year is up, it's got to go. And I sold it to my son's father-in-law. 
and he finished the car, and today it looks something like this. It took more than one of us. It took my brother, it took my dad, it took me, it took him, and it took a, you know, I had to have the clutch replaced, so I, I sent it out to get a special clutch made. And I, it, it took a whole lot of people. Listen, it takes God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit to work us over to be holy, to make us to be what He intends us to be. And He says, don't be conformed to the world. They're not holy. They have no purpose. They don't even know who they are. People in the world don't know if they're male or female. Come on, don't conform to the world. Find what I, I set you apart for. It. Find that and be holy. Be what I set you apart to be. Wow. He said, now once you're set apart and you know what the purpose is, he says, now, Live reverently. Live, live like you mean it. Since you call on the Father who judges each man's works impartially. Now listen, we are not saved by our works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift from God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I don't get saved by making myself a good person I admit how ungodly worthless I am to God and then he takes that bucket of bolts that I am and he finishes them off and he puts me together so that I am who he wants me to be. He does it all, but he says each man's work. God judges our works. I don't get saved by my works, but once I'm saved, then I am to work for God and he will reward me for my works. Does that make sense? I'm saved by grace, but I'm rewarded for what I do. I'm saved by the grace of God, but I'm rewarded for what I do. He says, listen, live your lives as strangers, sojourners. Live your lives as a stranger here on planet Earth. You're dwelling in a tent. This isn't your sanctuary. This isn't your home. Your home is in heaven. He says, live your lives here in reverent fear. When I saw that word reverent fear, I don't know, it just popped in my head where Moses. Moses was uh, on the backside of the desert, living in tents, taking care of his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. And all of a sudden, there's a bush that turned on fire, and he turned to it and said, man, that bush is on fire. Doesn't tell us whether he thought lightning struck it or anything like that. And he said, look at the bush is on fire. It's not. It's not being consumed. I don't know how long he stood there with the sheep, but, you know, tending sheep's not a really active job, you know. Once you're there, they're grazing, and you're watching, you're looking, and that thing is just burning and burning. It should be gone by now. He pulls out his sundial. Hey, yes. That thing, it, how could it be burning for 30 minutes? Come on now. There's something. He goes over to the bush, and the Bible tells us in Exodus 3, God spoke to him out of the bush and said to him, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. He's talking to a burning bush. Here I am. And then, and then God spoke to him and said, take your sandals off. You're on holy ground. You are in my presence. You know he took his sandals off? I think I would too. There's a sense in every morning when I get up, instead of putting my shoes on, I should be taking my sandals off. Because I know God, you're a holy God, I'm to be holy. Because that's what he goes on to say, you're on holy ground. Listen, i got a purpose for you today. Take your sandals off. You're in my presence. So I, in a spiritual way in my head, i got to say, I'm taking my sandals off. Today I'm going to live for you, Lord. And I offer up this prayer. I, I do this almost daily. Lord, take charge of my day. That's my morning prayer. Bring into it what you want. Take out of it what you don't want. But Lord, let me see what you want me to do today. Take charge of my day. It's a reverent fear of God and who He is. And I'm going to do what He wants me to do. Live respectfully, reverently. The fifth thing He has is, don't conform to this world. How do I do that? By recalling redemption. You recall He says, as you know, 
For as you know, that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold. And I, most of us aren't trading in silver and gold. And, and I know that with the market as it is, you've got all these advertisements, buy gold, buy gold. And then I thought, well, what happens if the market crashes? Okay, and money's worthless, but I got a block of gold. What do I do? Do I go down and give it a little shaving off that block and say, I'm buying the bread with this little piece? I don't know how it all works. But I do, it's a monetary system. And the monetary system, he's saying here, it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Listen, you can't get saved with your silver and gold, and you can't buy God's grace with your silver and gold. That is not the way it works. He says, for you know that it was not by perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from an empty way of life. That's what my old life was, an empty way of life that was handed down to me from my forefathers, and this is the American dream, which is not the Christian dream. And, it's just, and all this success and prosperity and all of that, he says, that's not the dream. He says, well, remember, that did not pay the price that you owed for the wages of sin is death. He says, but you were bought with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was the sinless Son of God, who died on the cross in my place. He died the just for the unjust that he might bring me to God. Wow. I recall how I got saved. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. He, has, you see, he was chosen before the creation of the world to be the one to die for me. And it was revealed in the last times and through him... You believe in God. Without Him, I have no salvation. It's my way to come to God. I believe in God. Who raised Him from the dead and glorified Him. Now watch this. And so your faith and hope are in God. Listen, Jesus is our living hope. <laughs> I serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. There's a song that goes like that. A hymn. I serve a living Savior. He is alive Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 tells about how he's seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Other places say that he is interceding for me. He is my mediator between me and God. So when I pray Jesus, and I pray in the name of Jesus, he makes sense out of the nonsense I pray, so my prayer is always answered. Not always the way I deliver it up, but the way the Son fixes it to the Father, and then he answers it. I recall that I have a living hope. The next thing I notice in this passage, if I'm not going to conform to this world, he says, you need to love one another. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. So I've accepted Jesus as my Savior and I have purified myself. He says it's by obeying the truth, but Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. So I, I have purified my heart by believing in Jesus, and I'm following the way of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus, a disciple. He says that shows up in my life with a sincere love for my brothers. And then he says this, love one another deeply. The church, the body of Christ is where believers love one another. Listen, it's not just that I love them. They love me back. And then watch what he says deeply from the heart it's genuine it's not surface it's real first john 3:16 is like john 3:16 only it goes something like this if god so loved the world then we should love it too <laughs> that's my paraphrase we should love one another we should allow others to love us, and we should love one another. It goes both ways. The seventh thing I notice here in not conforming to the world is living like a Christian. For you have been born again. You see, he's writing to Christians. You've been born again. That means you've been born into God's family. Jesus is your older brother, according to the book of Romans. He's our older brother. That makes me part of the family. I should live like the family of God. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living word and enduring word of God. Now, I got the picture here, a famous picture of Jesus with Nicodemus. And Jesus uses the word of God 
In fact, he uses in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, he tells the story about Moses in the wilderness when the people sinned, God sent fiery serpents that bit them, and they were dying. And, and, and that was the wages of sin is death. They sinned, God sent serpents, they bit, they died. And, and then they went to Moses and said, Moses, pray for us. And Moses did, and God said, make a serpent and put it on a brass pole and lift that brass pole up. And, and when you lift that brazen serpent up, Anyone who looks to it will live, and if they don't look to it, they'll die. And so they had to trust the words of God given to Moses when he lifted it up, if I look, I'll live, and if I don't, I'll die. They had to trust the word of God. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up that serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, not on a pole, but on a cross, that whoever looks to him, believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 15. He took the word of God and he, he quoted it to Nicodemus and Nicodemus then becomes a believer and we have the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, following that, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You have to, he's saying, you're a Christian, live like it. For you have, quote, been born again. It's already happened. You've accepted Christ. So live like a Christian. Live like one. He says, hold on to the word. You don't want to not conform to this world? Then you hold on to the word. You do what the word says, and you know, your life will be so different than the world, you won't be conformed to it. He says, for all men are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers, uh, they fall but the word of the Lord stands forever. That's found in Isaiah 40, verses 6 and verse 8. He's dropped out verse 7, but in between, he's quoted these two verses to say it's like this. People are grass. They die. Oh, there are some are like flowers. They're glorious. They bloom. They're, man, they, they look so good, but they die. It doesn't matter who you are. Alexander the Great, it doesn't matter. And all the glory of the Greek Empire, gone. doesn't matter if you're Caesar, Julius Caesar, great conqueror, builder of Rome, uh, Caesar Augustus, doesn't matter, all gone, dead. They're gone, gone, gone. doesn't matter if you're George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, I don't care who it is, they're gone. Guess what? In the year 331 B.C., I believe is the year that Alexander Great died, the Word of God is still here. <laughs> Julius Caesar, what he reigned around, I think it was in the year uh, B.C. 27, he died. Pfft. Word of God still here. You know how many people have tried to destroy the Word of God? And the Word of God is still here. The Word of God stands forever. And this is the Word that was preached to you. You have something eternal. I have it up here on the screen. Some of you have it in a paper Bible. Some of you got it on your phone. It is the eternal word of God. And so he says, since you got the eternal word, get rid of all the junk in your life. You get in the word, you find out what it is that you need to get out of your life and so that you can be more transformed to the image of Christ and less conformed to the world. He says, therefore, get rid of the malice. Malice is all the evil in your life. That's what it is, evil. All the deceit, all your lying and deception. Tell the truth even if it hurts. All the hypocrisy. Quit pretending to be something you are not. You are a Christian who God set apart to be holy. Don't conform to the world. He said, be real, be real. Envy, quit being jealous. I don't care who it is. Jealous of a, your, your, a, a sister or brother-in-law, jealous of a parent, a child, jealous of, a, a, I don't care who, your neighbor, your boss, don't be jealous. And quit slandering, quit saying bad things about people. Even if they're bad, don't say bad things, just say what is positive, what will build them up. He said, you are a Christian, you are different than the world. You are different than the world. So when you get rid of something, though, you got to replace it or it won't become a habit. That's what you, you got to exchange the bad for a good. You got to find something good to put in its place. So you replace it. He says, like newborn babies crave pure sp spiritual milk. 
so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. You want to grow as a Christian? You've got to have pure spiritual milk. Now, in the King James Version, it translates it like this. This is a new, new King James Version. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the Word. I like that. You need the Word of God to grow. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Jesus said. Quoting from the Old Testament. I need daily, I need daily to be fed. Daily to be fed. If you're counting on once a week, I'm going to ask you, try that physically. Have lunch today and then wait till next Sunday afternoon, have your next lunch. You say, oh man, I'll be dying. Yep, you bet, you bet. Spiritually, it's the same. You need the word every single day because you don't live by word alone by bread alone he says that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the lord is gracious listen if you've experienced the grace of god he saved you he's talking to you here he's saying you need to be in the word every day now it just so happens that out in the lobby we have the most recent daily bread secret place and i still have bible reading schedules out there now i wouldn't advise jumping all the way back to january and trying to catch up on the bible reading schedule because it's already in chronicles but you pick up and you don't have to do all of it you, you could just say i'm going to just do the new testament part there i'm just going to every day you just read that one chapter or, or you or, or you get into the word you've got to do what your level of growth is here's a the, the pure milk of the word. The, the Bible later talks about the meat of the word in Hebrews. It says, by now you should be on adult, you should be on the stake in the word of God. But, but you still need baby food. Well, if you're spiritually a newborn Christian, you want baby food. You got to get the basics. But if you've been a seasoned Christian, you've known the Lord for years, you should be on to the stake, the deep stuff, the good stuff. And so he says, you need to replace. We need to place all the junk with the word in your life. With the word in your life. Here's what we have today. Don't conform to the world's mold. Instead, prepare your mind. He says, obey the Lord. He says, be holy. Yeah, become holy. He says, live reverently. He goes on, he says, recall God saved you. He redeemed you. He bought you. You were not your own. You belong to the Lord. Remember, that's going to show up loving other people. If I'm, if I'm a grouch, if I'm just a grouch, okay, it could be because I haven't had my Diet Coke. All right, and you haven't had your coffee? Get your coffee and love people. Listen, he says, it, it should show up in a changed heart that you love other believers. Listen, live Christ-like. Live like him. You're in the family. Live like him. Hold on to the word of God. He says, get rid of the junk in your life. When you're reading the word and the spirit conviction says, ah, you shouldn't be doing that. Then you get that out of your life. Oh, you should be doing this. Oh, then I put that in my life and I begin to make this transformation of my life by the renewing of my mind. I replace the junk with a whole new life. Wow. Wow. That's what's involved, according to Peter, in not conforming to this world. Not conforming to this world. And if you're a Christian, you can do that. You can do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Peter is so practical. May we now apply the things he's shared with us. And how not to conform to this world, but be transformed, and it begins with our minds. We've got to make a decision that I'm going to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And then I have to have the self-control to act on that. Help me, O oh God. Help me be that set-apart person that you saved me to be. Restore, O oh Lord, the joy of salvation that comes from a doing right. Bless, O oh Lord, 
that we might be holy as you are holy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.